Pop Harper glanced up at Eddie Willers as he came out of the president's office. It was a wise, slow glance. It seemed to say that he knew that Eddie's visit to their part of the building meant trouble on the line, knew that nothing had come of the visit, and was completely indifferent to the knowledge. It was the cynical indifference which Eddie Willers had seen in the eyes of the bum on the street corner. Say, Eddie, know where I could get some woolen undershirts? he asked. Tried all over town, but nobody's got them. I don't know, said Eddie, stopping. Why do you ask me? I just ask everybody. Maybe somebody will tell me. Eddie looked uneasily at the blank, emaciated face and white hair. It's cold in this joint, said Pop Harper. It's going to be colder this winter. What are you doing? Eddie asked, pointing at the pieces of typewriter. The damn thing's busted again. No use sending it out. Took them three months to fix it the last time. Thought I'd patch it up myself. Not for long, I guess. He let his fist drop down on the keys. You're ready for the junk pile, old pal. Your days are numbered. Eddie started. That was the sentence he had tried to remember. Your days are numbered. But he had forgotten in what connection he had tried to remember it. It's no use, Eddie, said Pop Harper. What's no use? Nothing. Anything. What's the matter, Pop? I'm not going to requisition a new typewriter. The new ones are made of tin. When the old ones go, that will be the end of typewriting. There was an accident in the subway this morning. Their brakes wouldn't work. You ought to go home, Eddie. Turn on the radio and listen to a good dance band. Forget it, boy. Trouble with you is you never had a hobby. Somebody stole the electric light bulbs again from off the staircase down where I live. I've got a pain in my chest. Couldn't get any cough drops this morning. The drugstore on our corner went bankrupt last week. The Texas Western Railroad went bankrupt last month. They closed the Queensboro Bridge yesterday for temporary repairs. Oh, well, what's the use? Who is John Galt? She sat at the window of the train, her head thrown back. One leg stretched across to the empty seat before her. The window frame trembled with the speed of the motion. The pane hung over empty darkness, and dots of light slashed across the glass as luminous streaks once in a while. Her leg, sculptured by the tight sheen of the stocking, its long line running straight over an arched instep to the tip of a foot in a high-heeled pump, had a feminine elegance that seemed out of place in the dusty train car, and oddly incongruous with the rest of her. She wore a battered camel's hair coat that had been expensive, wrapped shapelessly about her slender, nervous body. The coat collar was raised to the slanting brim of her hat. A sweep of brown hair fell back, almost touching the line of her shoulders. Her face was made of angular planes, the shape of her mouth clear-cut, a sensual mouth held closed with inflexible precision. She kept her hands in the coat pockets, her posture taut, as if she resented immobility, and unfeminine, as if she were unconscious of her own body that said it was a woman's body. She sat listening to the music. It was a symphony of triumph. The notes flowed up. They spoke of rising, and they were the rising itself. They were the essence and the form of upward motion. They seemed to embody every human act and thought that had ascent as its motive. It was a sunburst of sound, breaking out of hiding and spreading open. It had the freedom of release and the tension of purpose. It swept space clean and left nothing but the joy of an unobstructed effort. Only a faint echo within the sounds spoke of that from which the music had escaped but spoke in laughing astonishment at the discovery that there was no ugliness or pain, and there never had had to be. It was the song of an immense deliverance. She thought, for just a few moments while this lasts, it is all right to surrender completely, to forget everything and just permit yourself to feel. She thought, let go, drop the controls. This is it. Somewhere on the edge of her mind, under the music, she heard the sound of train wheels. They knocked in an even rhythm, every fourth knock accented, as if stressing a conscious purpose. She could relax because she heard the wheels. She listened to the symphony, thinking, this is why the wheels have to be kept going, and this is where they're going.
She had never heard that symphony before, but she knew that it was written by Richard Halley. She recognized the violence and the magnificent intensity. She recognized the style of the theme. It was a clear, complex melody at a time when no one wrote melody any longer. She sat looking up at the ceiling of the car, but she did not see it, and she had forgotten where she was. She did not know whether she was hearing a full symphony orchestra or only the theme. Perhaps she was hearing the orchestration in her own mind. She thought dimly that there had been premonitory echoes of this theme in all of Richard Halley's work, through all the years of his long struggle, to the day in his middle age when fame struck him suddenly and knocked him out. This, she thought, listening to the symphony, had been the goal of his struggle. She remembered half-hinted attempts in his music, phrases that promised it, broken bits of melody that started but never quite reached it. When Richard Halley wrote this, he... She sat up straight. When did Richard Halley write this? In the same instant, she realized where she was and wondered for the first time where that music came from. A few steps away at the end of the car, a brakeman was adjusting the controls of the air conditioner. He was blonde and young. He was whistling the theme of the symphony. She realized that he had been whistling it for some time, and that this was all she had heard. She watched him incredulously for a while before she raised her voice to ask, Tell me, please, what are you whistling? The boy turned to her. She met a direct glance and saw an open, eager smile as if he were sharing a confidence with a friend. She liked his face. Its lines were tight and firm. It did not have that look of loose muscles evading the responsibility of a shape, which she had learned to expect in people's faces. It's the Halley Concerto, he answered, smiling. Which one? The fifth? She let a moment pass before she said slowly and very carefully, Richard Halley wrote only four concertos. The boy's smile vanished. It was as if he were jolted back to reality, just as she had been a few moments ago. It was as if a shutter were slammed down, and what remained was a face without expression, impersonal, indifferent, and empty. Yes, of course, he said. I'm wrong, I made a mistake. Then what was it? Something I heard somewhere. What? I don't know. Where did you hear it? I don't remember. She paused helplessly. He was turning away from her without further interest. It sounded like a Halley theme, she said, but I know every note he's ever written, and he never wrote that. There was still no expression, only a faint look of attentiveness on the boy's face as he turned back to her and asked, You like the music of Richard Halley? Yes, she said. I like it very much. He considered her for a moment, as if hesitating. Then he turned away. She watched the expert efficiency of his movements as he went on working. He worked in silence. She had not slept for two nights, but she could not permit herself to sleep. She had too many problems to consider and not much time. The train was due in New York early in the morning. She needed the time, yet she wished the train would go faster. But it was the Taggart Comet, the fastest train in the country. She tried to think, but the music remained on the edge of her mind, and she kept hearing it in full chords, like the implacable steps of something that could not be stopped. She shook her head angrily, jerked her hat off, and lighted a cigarette. She would not sleep, she thought. She could last until tomorrow night. The train wheels clicked in accented rhythm. She was so used to them that she did not hear them consciously, but the sound became a sense of peace within her. When she extinguished her cigarette, she knew that she needed another one, but thought that she would give herself a minute, just a few minutes before she would light it. She had fallen asleep, and she awakened with a jolt, knowing that something was wrong, before she knew what it was. The wheels had stopped. The car stood soundless and dim in the blue glow of the night lamps. She glanced at her watch. There was no reason for stopping. She looked out the window. The train stood still in the middle of empty fields. She heard someone moving in a seat across the aisle and asked, How long have we been standing? A man's voice answered indifferently, About an hour. The man looked after her, sleepily astonished. 
because she leaped to her feet and rushed to the door. There was a cold wind outside and an empty stretch of land under an empty sky. She heard weeds rustling in the darkness. Far ahead she saw the figures of men standing by the engine, and above them, hanging detached in the sky, the red light of a signal. She walked rapidly toward them, past the motionless line of wheels. No one paid attention to her when she approached. The train crew and a few passengers stood clustered under the red light. They had stopped talking. They seemed to be waiting in placid indifference. 